Hello and welcome to Cyberdeck Users Weekly. I have a very special guest today. His name is Jeremy Solar. Hello, Jeremy. Hi, how's it going? Good. Uh, so you are the... I mean, first off, thank you so much for being here. I'm very mm-hmm. excited to talk to you. Glad to be here. Uh, you are the the benevolent, benevolent dictator for life of Redox OS and um, a principal engineer at System76. Uh, what, 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 what do those two terms mean? Well, uh, I created the Redox project in 2015, and uh, I intend to, to control its direction. And if you don't like that, you can fork it, which is, <laughs> it's, that's the beauty of open source. So uh, I think it's a, a model that works really well with a lot of other open source projects uh, to have one person who makes the decision of what ends up in the master branch of all of the related projects of Redox. And it is open source, so I expect there to be distributions and deviations from what is the official upstream version of Redox. Mm. At System76, my role is to is to support the hardware that we sell, uh, and that's through a whole bunch of different fronts. That's through firmware development, that's through hardware development, uh, both electrical engineering and mechanical engineering, and that's through software development and through our operating system, Pop! OS. So those are kind of the, the four different things that I look at at System76. And thankfully, they all kind of tie together because uh, for Redox, I do a lot of low-level development, and that informs my work at System76 and vice versa. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of hardware available at System76, and that I can use to improve Redox. And I've used Rust on, on both extensively. Obviously, Redox OS is, its entire purpose is to be primarily written in a, in a language such as Rust uh, that has safety guarantees, and that's all the way from the kernel up. And at System76, we, we use Rust all over the place in firmware, in Pop! OS, um, in driver support, everywhere. Yeah, you, you mentioned that your work um, on, on both things and forming the other, and I'm really interested, how did, how did you even get... Um, your foot in the door with this sort of low level programming. My, my history, I started out with Dreamweaver, right? So I feel like mm. over the years, very slowly have slowly sunk below the front end into slightly lower levels. But there, there's something still very intimidating about, about registers and assembly and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think it, I think it can be very difficult to get into. And uh, I was lucky that I was given some really low performance computers to start with. Uh, my first computer was a $25 laptop and that was 20 years ago. So you can imagine <laughs> it was, it was a, already a 10 year old laptop 20 years ago. So you can imagine how terrible that was. Uh, but uh, it, it ran Windows 3.1 okay. poorly and I replaced it with DOS and that was really the reason why I got into doing assembly is I had to do a lot of things in assembly um, just to work on the machine. And I was very interested in, in how computers worked uh, at a more atomic level. Not really the, the big picture things, but how did those little tiny operations that a processor, how, how did those add up to the big picture things? So I've, Redox is not the first operating system or kernel that I've worked on. Um, the first operating system I ever wrote, uh, it was all 32-bit assembler. And it was, um, it could load ELF files, it had a C library, but everything was written in assembler. And uh, I don't know, I guess, if you're really attracted to assembly language, I think that indicates that that low level things are going to be easy for you. And I, I do think that's the biggest barrier is to learn how assembly language works and how how a processor works on a 
per cycle kind of view of the processor. And from there, you build it out to so many abstractions above that um, in kernels and in programs and in the final user experience. But um, I think people are lucky to start at one of those ends of the spectrum and work from there. I, I think if you are interested in, in the user experience and, and what happens when, well, in, um, in kind of the final product that the user gets, I think it's very hard to drive much of that from the low level. But at the same time, none of that's possible without the low level. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm working on like a, uh, a UI toolkit in Rust right now. And, mm -hmm. and, and I feel like that's very inspired by when you are floating up at the high level, you're like, ah, there are so many layers of abstraction and some of them aren't good anymore. There are, or they, right. they, don't, they don't, at least they don't feel like they're good or they don't, this seal feels like it's slower than the hardware is, you know, and, and mm -hmm. it's, so you're, you're tempted to go down, but you know, when you start digging in, you're like, well, how deep do you want to dig to, to actually improve user experience, you know, and you, you yeah. have to throw away so many of the abstractions that have been made at, at the user level that it takes a long time to get all the way back to something usable. Yeah, and there are lots of really great examples of, of this problem happening over and over and over. And not just in, in free software. That's the easiest way to, to inspect it. But if you, like if you look at a modern Linux operating system and you, you look at how long the Linux kernel and X11 and the GNU user space have stayed around, these items have stayed around because they've done their section of the, the low to high level you know, set of components really well, well enough that trying to replace them has become incredibly difficult. Mm 